Grab your Bibles and open up, as has been shared, to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we are working our way through this book. It's, it's been kind of the entirety of our year working through this gospel. And this morning, we'll have a number of different things on the screens behind me, but for the text that we're in, I want to encourage you to, to read in your Bible or a device where you can access the scriptures. Um, won't have all those scriptures up on screen, so I'd love to encourage you to, to grab a device and open up to God's Word. I'll be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation. And this morning, as has been shared, the, the heartbeat of this message is very simple. It's about the state of our hearts. We're going to learn from God's word this morning some truths that I think are very familiar to many of us. Anyone ever heard of the great commandment in scripture? To love God and to love yeah, Jimmy and I have heard it. That's good. Yeah, love God and love others. Well, except for Jimmy and I, this is new information to you. So, but it's very familiar, I thought, to some. But my, my point is, you're going to hear some words from Jesus this morning that for many of us, this won't be the first time you've considered them. But it's my heart and my hope and my prayer that you catch what Jesus' intent, his heart, as he's sharing with some individuals this morning that are very kind of antagonistic towards him. Some that are open, but he responds to both crowds with this invitation to live in that sweet spot of life of a surrendered heart to him. And it's my hope, and I'm gonna pray together with us this, in the next few moments that this would happen, that, that none of us would leave this place without an opportunity of just freshly surrendering ourselves to him. You know, it's interesting in scripture, speaking on salvation. The New Testament makes it very clear that salvation is something that is past, present, and future for the believer. Say, so what do you mean by that? Do you know why we get together as believers for church on a Sunday morning? It's because on Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. So we gather together in faith and in an atmosphere of celebration that we're not, no longer held by sin's penalty or power. Jesus is alive. That's why Christians began to get together on Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. That was the day that for those of the Jewish faith, they kind of hallowed as a day of rest as unto the Lord. But when Jesus rose again, everything changed for the believer. It wasn't just one day that was set aside. It's every day and the day that reminded them of the most important aspect of their relationship with God is that Jesus has made a way for them to be forgiven, to be free, to be a part of the family of God, to have a future because he rose from the dead. And salvation for a believer, in some ways, it's a past thing. You say, what do you mean? You can remember that time where you surrendered your life, placed your faith and trust in what Jesus did. And it's a solid, settled thing. Jesus' death on the cross, that penalty that he paid on your behalf and mine was proved to be valid and sufficient because of Sunday. Because he rose from the dead. That's something secure that you can take to the bank. You don't have to live in this atmosphere of ambiguity wondering, well, am I, am I still in God's good graces? Does he still love me? Am I, am I still forgiven? If your faith and trust is in Jesus, it's a done deal. Amen. But then also, this is kind of where we'll spend some time a little bit this morning. The Bible also speaks of salvation as a very present thing that God is saving us, changing us, transforming us more and more into the image of his son, to be like him. Where salvation starts is right where it is today, a fresh place of surrender. To live life as it's intended to be lived with, with fullness in your heart only comes through the avenue of surrender. We, we've been saved, we're, we're being saved, and then one day, the presence of sin will be done away with. There'll be no more cancer, no more death, no more news ticking feeds about this war and that 
pestilent, this storm, the presence of sin will be done away with. Amen. And so this morning, the, man, the simplicity of the message is going to be about a surrendered heart. We're going to go through a lot of the Bible. Anyone okay with that in church on Sunday morning? Like, okay. Yeah, we're going to read the Bible, teach the Bible, learn from God's word. But here's my hope. Here's my heart. That, that we have a fresh place of surrender in our lives. I really do believe that that's what Jesus is speaking to those in this original audience. And I also believe that to us, that's where he wants us. Father, I just ask and pray that you would do a work that I, I just believe only you can do. It is a miracle that your son rose from the dead on a Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago. A miracle that he conquered sin, death, and the grave. And it's also a miraculous thing for a life to be changed. Lord, I, don't, I would never, never give this air that I understand completely how you miraculously work to change a person's life. I know that it's only through your son. I know it's through individuals as they place their faith and trust in you. I know, God, it's as you sovereignly work in their lives. And I know that it's a miraculous thing, cannot be manufactured by will or grit, that a life is changed from the inside out. Lord, today, would you just lead us to a place of fresh surrender? Lord, there is so much noise around us in this culture. For these next few moments, as we're in your word, Lord, we're here to be trained by your word, not, not necessarily be entertained by it. Give us that filter. Give us that focus. Give us that ability to right now to lean into your word to be challenged in our hearts, to be challenged even as we navigate the truths of your word. And Lord, most importantly, that you would be lifted up. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as we've been studying through this gospel week in and week out over this year, I think we've made the point and I think we've owned this reality of why Mark wrote this gospel. Mark shares the stories, the teachings, the parables, the miracles, the, the life events of Jesus in a way that's very calculated. It's not haphazard. It's not like Mark just sat down, oh, yeah, this, oh, and I forgot about, no. He's sharing very directly, very pointedly about who Jesus is in a way that's meant to jolt his readers to a clear understanding. I've shared this with you before, but I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. One author put it this way, that the, the gospel of Mark, it's fast moving. It's hard hitting. It's like, it's like, think of Mark as like an old Western gunslinger with a six shooter. Like in rapid fire succession, he's, he's sharing specific events of the life of Jesus to prove. Now, primarily those that read this at the beginning were Romans, those that weren't familiar with the Jewish faith. But here's what he's proving throughout this book. Who Jesus is, that he's the Christ, that he's the son of God, and he's the one who served and suffered, died, and rose again. Like, like that is the intent of even the content that we're going to take in this morning in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Now, our current setting, like where are we in the life of Jesus in Mark chapter 12? Well, we're in that final week of his life before he goes to the cross. He's already entered Jerusalem in what's commonly known as the, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. And Mark gives us a tremendous amount of insight into what this last week of Jesus' life looked like before he went to the cross. Now, in the last couple of weeks on Sunday mornings, we've been engaging with, considering, how some of the religious and even the political leaders of the day, they begin to show up on the scene and almost kind of descend upon Jesus. Not to get a selfie, not, not to get a signature. They're there to trap Jesus. And in these chapters that we've been considering for the last two weeks and today, Mark records a total of four questions from, from different groups within those who either had religious authority or political authority, and they've been posing these questions to Jesus, the first of which we saw in chapter 11 and 12 about his authority. Now listen, 
the religious leaders, part of their responsibility to the people was to lead the people. So if you had a Jewish rabbi show up on the scene claiming the things that Jesus was claiming, doing the things that Jesus was doing, well, it makes sense that they would say, hey, you know, where do you get your authority from? But if you've read the Gospel of Mark up to this point, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, it has been crystal clear who Jesus is and by whose authority he does his miracles, his works, his teachings in. This question of his authority came from a very disgenuine heart, from a group that was really just seeking their own position and seeking to position Jesus in a place where either the Jews would turn on him, his following would turn on him, or the Romans would. And then we saw last week a question of responsibility, I guess you could say. Groups that would never see eye to eye on anything, the Herodians, the Pharisees, one group supported and benefited kind of from the, the rule that was in, in place of the Romans and Herod and the other Pharisees who were adamantly opposed to that. They asked this question about, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus shares the heart of the matter is they're not surrendered enraptured by God themselves. It was something else. They weren't asking what's true, what's right. They're really self-interested, self-motivated. Man, I read something this week I just want to share with you. I won't put it up on the screen, but I thought it was insightful. He said, those who were asking these questions, they weren't asking what's right, what's true. They're asking, hey, what is safe? And he said, this is always the approach of the hypocrite and the crowd pleaser. That was the motivation for these individuals who were seeking to ask questions of Jesus. It wasn't to lean in and to learn about him or to know him, but for them to kind of maintain the king's position of their own little lives, their own little kingdom. Now, Jesus, as we've seen, he's answered these questions with brilliance. And you would think by now that maybe the religious leaders would kind of back off, kind of keep quiet. They, they've learned that this rabbi who's from Nazareth, who if you knew anything about the culture at that time, it wasn't seen as this thing to put on your resume. I'm from Nazareth. That he's not a simpleton, but he's sophisticated. He knew what was within man, the Bible tells us. And they continued to ask questions. And here's what we'll see in chapter 12 this morning. Mark records for us Two questions that these religious elite pose to Jesus, and we'll consider the, his response. And at the end of this chapter this morning, Jesus actually poses his own question and kind of gives two very stern warnings about living, about giving. But, but let's step into the story. Let, let's jump into the text. We'll start in verse 18 of Mark chapter 12. Verse 18, Mark records this for us, that Jesus, he writes, was approached by some Sadducees. He explains who these guys are. They're religious leaders who say there's no resurrection from the dead, and they pose a question. Look at verse 19. Teacher, teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies leaving a wife without children, well, his brother should marry the widow, have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Now suppose, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children, so the second brother married the widow and he also died without children. And then the third brother married her and this continued with all seven. And still there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, Jesus, Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Now, a couple things. The, the group that shows up on the scene, the Sadducees. We've already considered two other groups, right? The, the chief priests and scribes, they went first with their shot at Jesus, asking about his authority. Then the Herodians, the Pharisees, they got together and asked their tax question. Now, these guys, who are the Sadducees? Well, they're kind of this small aristocratic, wealthy group 
that over time had kind of risen to places of, of prominence, like, like significant political sway and influence into the life of the temple. Most of the people, even the Pharisees, other religious leaders, they disagreed with a lot of the things that the Sadducees believed. But this group was kind of a, I don't know, they were kind of like an insulated, kind of smug, elitist-style group. They only held that the, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, known as the law, that those were the only inspired and authoritative words of God. They held no stock in the books of poetry, like the Psalms of David, the prophets. And they didn't put any stock at all in the supernatural. Miracles, demons, angels, the fact that, that humankind has an ability to go beyond this life in the spiritual realm, the resurrection. You know, those guys are still very much alive today. They, they don't go by the name Sadducee, but you, you ever seen those specials that'll surface, either in like a print magazine on, on a rack at a grocery store right around an Easter, an Easter time frame or Christmas or a, a special on a channel that kind of highlights these religious scholars who cast doubt on nearly everything the Bible has to say, seeking to distract. You know, like a cell phone going off. That's who these guys are, right? Like they're just, they're just noise. That's kind of who they are. They're seeking to distract and kind of belittle anything that goes on in God's word that points to who God is. Just kind of see it as like ancient book, ancient ideas, ancient literature. That's the Bible. That's the Sadducees. Now, you know the, um, the Sunday school joke about them, right? Why are they called Sadducees? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And Jenny, you know this, right? We grew up together. That's why they're sad, you see, right? That's where they get their name. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in God. Okay, that's super cheesy, but that's where we are. Well, here's the deal. Even though they're kind of like this insulated, smug, kind of elitist group, don't get along, don't play well, don't play nice with others, just like the others, they feel that they've got this kind of cunning, curated, specific question that's going to corner Jesus. They're asking about a scenario that in that culture, everyone is familiar with. This kind of marriage dynamic that's described, it's called the Leverett marriage, where a brother of a deceased man marries the, the, the widow to provide an heir. Everyone that's hearing this would have been familiar with that. Now, for us, especially for those of us in the room, that's probably not something we're familiar with. And if you are, maybe we should have a discussion afterwards. But like this question, here's the point. Even though like the cultural dynamics are a little foreign to us, the question is meant to be ridiculous. Like this, this doesn't happen, right? Like by, by the fourth or fifth brother, they got to be like, who is this woman and why is everyone dying, right? Like <laughs> this scenario is not realistic. It's meant to make like the resurrection look like this is just ludicrous. Like, yeah, a scenario like that, there could be no resurrection, now, is this just kind of some question they had in their holster that they asked the Pharisees, they asked any religious leader? Well, if you know your Bible, remember, Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, three times Jesus has said very clearly that he will die and he will rise what? Rise again. He said it three times before. These guys aren't there to lean in. They're not there to get their theology straightened out. They're there to kind of keep their own place of smug elitism and be able to control everything and to kind of corner Jesus. And look at how he replies, Jesus, verse 24. Quick and quick-witted. Your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. If there was a mic, he would have dropped it. Jesus isn't afraid to call something wrong. Man, that's desperately needed in our culture for those that follow Jesus. Truth and love, but truth, let it have its stay. Quick and quick-witted, Jesus says very clearly, you know what, elitists, those that have memorized the first five books, you know it, you say, you don't know the word. You don't know the power of God. Look at how he kind of unpacks this. Verse 25. 
For when the dead rise, he says, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses in the story of the burning bush? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. So here's Jesus' point. He's the God of the living, not the dead. You've made a small error. You've made a serious error. We're going to unpack what he says in just a moment, but don't miss the error. They didn't know the word of God. They didn't know the power of God. Let's come back to that in just a moment, but let's unpack what's happening here. Jesus educates the highly educated, the elite. He doesn't say if the, no, he says when the resurrection happens. Number one, I'll, I'll speak to your question, I guess he says. <sighs> Glorified human beings won't be given in marriage. They, they won't remarry. And that way, they'll be like angels. They won't become angels like Casper of the 90s, the mom on the scene. If you know that, you don't, okay, then you don't need to know that. But that's not the situation. And Jesus, so insightful, so aware, so present, he knows his audience, those that pride themselves on knowing the five books. And he says, hey, you guys ever read Exodus? They would have been like, what, does a slap in the, yes, we know Exodus. You know where God says this in that story? You ever heard of Burning Bush? You ever went to Sunday school? You know, Sadducees? Yes, we know what you're talking about. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they're dead. He says, I am the God. Why does this matter? Abraham would have passed hundreds of years before Moses, as would have Isaac and Jacob. But alive when God spoke to Moses. God had a continuing relationship with them because of the truth of the afterlife. And here's the thing I want us to circle back to. Jesus says, here's the serious mistake. Man, if Jesus really rose from the dead and he said, hey, there's a serious mistake, I would say right now would be a good time to like wake up and listen, okay, what's the mistake? I don't want to make it either. You don't know the word of God nor the power of God. You've heard that old adage in church before. All spirit and no word, you might blow up, but all word and no spirit and you'll dry up. Like this balance in a Christian's life to know God personally and the work that he's powerfully able to do through his spirit and also know the word of God well. He said, here's the serious mistake. You don't know the word of God, nor do you know the power of God. We live in a world, time, and age, and era, like was shared earlier, just as we're talking and considering about all the things that are happening on the world stage, that is very much is very unparalleled, but it's also promised. But we'll see that next week. But also in an age where um, you don't have to be uninformed, there's more access to the things of God, at least his word, than any other generation that has ever existed. You can hear the best preaching this generation has to offer at your fingertips. It's available to you all around the world. But knowing it, not, not as much it seems. You know, I did like a top 10 Google search of things that aren't in the Bible but people think that are. Now, I'll just read a couple of them to you. Now, now, don't misunderstand this. Some of the sentiments behind these words are in the Bible, but not necessarily these phrases like this. To thine own self be true. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Once saved, always saved. Let there be moderation in all things. God helps those who help them what? Yeah. Cleanliness is next to God works in now, there's truths to these things. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But you miss things if you only have bumper sticker theology. Like, you know, there wasn't necessarily an apple in the garden. It wasn't three wise men. It wasn't a whale that swallowed Jonah. Well, what's the point? The point is to know the word. I mean, I wish there was a church that took knowing God's word so seriously 
that they dedicated every single morning to emailing you a two-minute devotional so that as you read through God's word, you could learn God's word. Wouldn't that be a miraculous thing if there was a church that cared that much about you knowing God's word? <laughs> to, to know God's word. To know God's word. But listen, here's where I just want to camp for just a second. I just, it, it just happens. This just happens, I've seen, as you go through life. You lose perspective of who God is. Man, life is sad sometimes. Life is confusing. There's things that happen in life that you just, man, I didn't see that coming. There's things that happen, you go, I, I can't explain that. And if you're not careful, there's this temptation to lose awareness of who God is. Say, what do you mean? Jesus said, here's your serious mistake. You don't know the word of God, and you don't know the power of God. You don't think God can rise individuals from the dead? We're talking about God, the ultimate causer. One of my kids, we always ask, you know, they ask these big questions. And they start, well, if, you know, who created God was eventually where the question came from. I said, well, that's called the infinite regress. Like eventually, there has to be an uncaused agent or else you just keep going round and round and round we go. And that's who God is. The one who is. And has the power to save your marriage. Has the power to change your life. Has the power to, to, to raise that which is dead to life. Amen. To, to give hope, to give meaning, to give forgiveness. These Sadducees, the reason they were so sad, you see, is there was no faith in who God is. Have you ever met any believers who you go, man, you're kind of sad, I can see. Like, there's no sense of wonder of who God is. We live in a broken world, and I'm not talking about faith in faith. Well, that's worthless. I'm talking about faith in God, who is capable to do things that we can either fathom or imagine. Listen, the Bible opens with the miraculous. God speaks, and everything, boom, bang, goes into existence. But these individuals did not allow, did not believe, did not behave in such a way that in reality, that God is God and he has the power to do anything. Listen, we're going to close in a few minutes. We still have a lot of text to go through, but I already shared with you this morning kind of the hope and heart of this message is just that you would leave in a place of a surrendered heart. Could it be that in your life, in my life, in our lives together, that you lose that sense of who you're singing to on a Sunday morning, of why you showed up on a Sunday? Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we're here. He's given meaning to my life and purpose. These Sadducees were those that didn't know God's word, didn't know how to stand on it. And didn't live in the reality that God is God. God of power who can do anything. And Jesus, to bring us back into context to where we are, <laughs> Jesus is navigating every little nasty trap that these religious leaders are trying to set for him. And Mark makes an interesting notation here. If, you, if you're a Bible student, if you read through the Gospels and you know this thing known as the great commandment. Well, at least Jimmy and I do from a few minutes ago, like that Jesus is asked by a lawyer, one of the, one of the religious leaders, what's the greatest commandment? That, that's what we're about to see here. But look at how Mark describes the, the setting. Verse 28, one of the teachers of the religious law, he's standing there and listening to this debate and he realized that, that Jesus had answered well. So he asks of all the commandments, which is the most important? You know, for those that were living at this time, the religious leaders shared with God's people that there were at least 600 plus commandments of God that we needed to keep and that were priority. 365 negative, one for every day of the week, and 248 positive. Can you imagine that being on your to-do list? Okay, don't forget my 365 and my 248 for today. And so there was often this question What's the most important? Well, 
it seems like from this verse that Mark describes that this religious leader, there's some sense of awakening to who Jesus is. We know from the Gospel of Matthew as he records this same account that still there was this tone to this question where they're just seeking to trap Jesus. But be that as it may, no one's been able to answer this question, it seems, sufficiently. Jesus doesn't miss a beat. Look at verse 29. He replies, the most important commandment is, listen, O Lord, o, o Israel, the Lord your God is one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is, is equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. There, there's no other commandment greater than these, Jesus says. Now, for me, context of what's happening helps the text that I'm reading really come alive. There's something interesting I learned this week as I was reading about this. When Jesus was a little boy, growing up most likely in his stepdad's workshop, Joseph's workshop, there was a well-known Jewish rabbi at the time by the name of Hillel, famous teacher. And here was his summary of the law. This would have been the mantra that most of the people would have had when they would have heard Jesus just share what he had to say. Here's what Hillel would have said. The summary of the law, what you yourself hate, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary. That's kind of the, um, to borrow like a Superman illustration, like the, the bizarro way to kind of share the golden rule, right? It's like the opposite lens of that. But you need, there's no mention of God with this understanding of like, what's the greatest thing? What's the greatest commandment? What, that, that would have been the tone of the day. Well, Hillel says, whatever you hate, don't do to your neighbor. That's the, everything else is commentary. Okay, there's definitely truth to that. What does Jesus say? Here's what Jesus says. First and foremost, everything is about God. Lainey Louise Pearl is at the intellectual capacity where she can kind of understand that. Oh, God, Jesus, this is why I'm here. She's two, if you don't know who Lainey is. Jesus said the law is a vehicle to show us how to be, not just how to behave. And here's how to be. Here's the presence you need. Love God. Now, he says here something that I think is very, very attractional to us in Western mindset. He gives these four different, he says, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, the center of your feelings, your, your deep understanding and imagination, no, your strength, all the force and ability you can muster. I love how one author describes this. He says, breaking his answer into four components is, well, what someone from the Western world would do, but the Middle Eastern mind didn't work that way. Jesus meant the answer to be taken in total. In other words, the chief commandment is to love God as hard as you can with everything you've got to be all in. Like, that, like that's the greatest thing in life is to be one who is created in love with the creator, walking with him. You've heard it said before that the heart of every matter is the matter of the what? Heart. And the heart of hearts is a heart for God. And listen, please don't miss this. This is how everything goes from grayscale to vibrant color in your life. When your job becomes a way to bring joy to God, that's when it's fruitful and satisfying. When your marriage is more about you fulfilling your God-given role as unto him, that's when love is found. When your parenting is more about your God-given role to him, that's where hope is found in parenting. Marriages yielding to his leadership Families become healthy when this happens. Friendships actually gain depth. Churches, churches become fruitful when it's about loving him. Well, that's why we do what we do. That's why we sing. That's why we care. That's why we, we give. It's why we serve. It's why we listen to sermons and Neil share cheesy jokes or whatever. That's why it's not about, it's about God. It's about him. 
When loving God becomes the goal, everything finds its fit. A commute becomes a chance to listen to his word. A walk becomes an opportunity to pray. A work shift becomes the shift in mind to give work ethic that pleases God. Friendships become a way to kind of see the image of God in another angle in another person. Life becomes what it's meant to be because it's about loving him. You know, there's this age-old question that those that don't know God, can they do anything good, moral, any benefit? Absolutely. Individuals can be very humanitarian, and many do. But it's interesting, if you know anything about the history books, it's always been Christians who've led the way with why we have things called hospitals or care for the sick. See, the greatest moral good is not self-love. It's a love for God. And a proper love for God will give you a proper perspective of who you are. God loves me. <laughs> that, that's where I find my value. That's where I find my worth. It's not about me kicking rocks into the Grand Canyon of my soul, hoping to fill it with self-love. That will never happen. It's first and foremost understanding who God is and how much he loves me. And then I can love others, as Jesus would say, this is an equal commandment. Uh, let me read this to you. Loving God isn't just about his worthiness, but our holiness. A love for God will keep you out of all kinds of trouble. Can I say that again? A love for God will keep you out of all kinds of trouble. When the love of God is your, the filter you use to make every decision in life, that's when you become more sanctified. When love for God helps you decide who to date, what to consume, how to work. Listen to what he says. Your life becomes holier, and from holiness springs health. The best version of life imaginable in a fallen, broken world. I'm not suggesting we should love God as a thin veil for self-love. I'm suggesting that God knows if we love him more than we love ourselves or anyone else, we'll end up in a healthy spot. So his command to love flows from his love for us. Don't know what to do? Love God in your current context, situation, challenge, opportunity, and dynamic. And look at how this guy responds. It's in verse 32 of Mark chapter 12. The teacher, he says, well said, Jesus. <laughs> well said. You've spoken the truth by saying there's only one God and no other. And I know it's important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Look at verse 34. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. It's kind of a rare thing to read in the Gospels that someone actually got what Jesus was saying, especially from the religious elite. But Jesus told him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. This man affirmed what Jesus says. We're not giving in, given any indication that he made that very distant trek, distant trek of 18 inches, like head to heart. You know, you've heard that said before, that the, the longest distance to go in life is those 18 inches from your head to your heart. Because that's really where it is. That's where life begins. You surrender all of who you are to Jesus. And that's where life sustains itself. And I'm living a surrendered life before you, Lord. It's not about my agenda, my wants, my perceived needs. It's about, Lord, how can I just love you? And the questions end. No one seems to ask any more, it seems. And so Jesus asks one. Look at verse 35. Mark records for us that later Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, and he asks, why did the teachers of the religious law claim that the Messiah is the son of David. Now, everyone would have gone, well, Jesus, you, you read the Psalms, you know, okay. Question kind of grows a little bit. He says, for David himself was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and said this, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David himself called the Messiah, my Lord, 
how can the Messiah be his son? And the large crowd listened to him with great delight. Now, for us, you might be reading this going, Yoda, what are you saying there? Like, let's see if we can unpack that just a little bit. Religious leaders have asked all their questions, right? Now Jesus asks his. Not to necessarily trip and trap the religious leaders. He's not, he's not playing games. He's there in the temple teaching from a psalm of David that they would have recognized as a psalm that had meaning about the Messiah. But his question is, how can you, how can they, religious leaders say, that the Messiah, who David also calls my Lord, is also the son of David? Like, where, where is he going with this? Well, have you ever heard Jesus referred to as Jesus Christ? Yeah, many of us, right? You know that it's not his last name. It's more of a title. And that title, Christ, is synonymous with the term Messiah, anointed one, the promised one, the one who would deliver God's people. Well, those that would have been there in that first century Jewish mindset had this strong idea of a Davidic Messiah, a Messiah who would come from David's lineage. So to speak of him as the son of David was basically to say he's the Messiah. And these religious leaders thought they knew everything there was to know about this coming Messiah. And Jesus challenges them by saying this, since David himself called the Messiah my Lord, how can he be his son? You go, okay, still you haven't answered the Yoda riddle. What is he saying here? Jesus is not questioning the lineage of the Messiah. Would he come from David? Of course. But he's saying there's so much more than the Messiah, me, being the great, 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 great grandson of King David. He wanted them to see that not only would he be called the son of David, but the son of God. Let me share this with you. I'll put it up on the screen. David thought of the coming Christ, the Messiah through whom God would establish a forever kingdom as his Lord. The Messiah would be a man, but the Messiah would be God. Again, the two complete natures of Jesus Christ, they're highlighted in this passage, fully God and fully man. This morning, we're seeing these relentless leaders offering these attempts with questions to trip and tra trap Jesus. He engages with them. But he asked this thoughtful question, why? Remember with me what I shared with us this morning at the, the very beginning of our opening God's word this morning. Why did Mark write the gospel that he authored? To show and to share with those who were reading a very clear picture of who Jesus is. Remember this, we put it up on the screen earlier that the gospel of Mark it's fast-moving, hard-hitting, rapid-fire succession. He's using specific events to prove that he is the Christ. See, it's moments like this in the life of Jesus where you are left with, challenged to, give an answer. Jesus is just a nutty lunatic. He's saying that of himself, he's 100% God and 100% man. Jesus is either crazy, he's deceptive, or he is who he says he is. That's, that's where we're all left. And that's why Jesus asked this simple question to draw attention to who he truly is. He's God. And as he shared over and over again, God came in his son Jesus to die and to rise again. And now, as we close out this morning, as we close out this chapter, Jesus gives two warnings that I think pair perfectly with the truths that we've been considering this morning about who Jesus is and that it's the heart that matters most. Let me just read them to you. We're, we're almost done. Verse 38, Mark records for us that Jesus also taught to beware of these teachers of religious law, he said. For they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in marketplaces. And how they love seats of honor and the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property. And they pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, he says, they will be more severely punished. 
Jesus says, watch out for anyone who uses religious service or religious identity or office or platform to inflate ego. It's not the way. It's about the heart. It's not about what others see and what others think. The language here is so very intense that in a parallel account, Matthew chapter 23, for you that are students of the Bible, I encourage you to check that out, records almost a whole chapter of things that Jesus says about those who seek their identity, specifically on a religious platform, to inflate their own ego and have nothing to do with a heart for God. In that chapter, there's seven woes, denunciations of people like this. You know, a, a little over a decade ago, there was a Christian artist who had this one lyric I want to read to you. He says, why are you following God when you can get it all? Referring back to how Lucifer, Satan, tempted even Adam. And he says, I'll tell you what's better or better yet worse, chasing your own glory by doing the Lord's work. Like seeking to build a platform on the back of Jesus for yourself. Pride. A heart that's not really after God. Jesus gives this warning, have nothing to do with these individuals. And then kind of in contrast and as an example, here's the point. Here, here's where we'll end. Look at verse 41. Here's what life should look like as someone who's surrendered. Look at verse 41. It says that Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple, watches crowds. They, they're dropping their money. Many rich put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came, drops in two small coins. And Jesus calls his disciples and says, listen, this is notable for Jesus. He says, listen, boys, I want you to see what just happened. I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all others who are making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. She lives surrendered. She lives surrendered. I love what Warren Wearsby, if you're in one of our connect groups, small group Bible studies that are meeting throughout the week in just so many different locations throughout the community, and you're kind of going through a sermon-based group, you'll, you'll recognize the name Warren Wearsby. He's a commentator that we're using as a kind of a resource guide with questions for navigating that time in your Bible study. I wanted to share with you something he shares about this section of Scripture. He says, this closes with two warnings, a warning against pride from the scribes and pride of the, of the rich. He said, if a person is important only because of the uniform he wears, the title he bears, the office he holds, then his importance is artificial. It's character that makes a person valuable. And nobody can give you character. You must develop it yourself as you walk with God. It's a love for God that develops that which ultimately lasts. And Jesus here, speaking to the heart of the matter, says, look at this woman. Here's how she lives. Not like this with everything she has, worried about the shoulda, woulda, couldas, or if, ands, and buts, or maybes. Not, not living like this towards God because things didn't go the way she desired or hoped. But hands like this, surrendered. And this is a choice that you and I make daily with the dynamics in our life. How are you going to hold on to relationships, hold on to possessions, hold on to your position? This and this will get you nowhere but downward. This is the place. Surrender. Surrender. Walking in a place where God you give and you take away. I trust you. I trust you. It's the place where life goes from gray scale to vibrant color. Where you live in that sweet spot of life where you say, God, I just want to love you and I want to trust you. And you know what that does for every moment? It makes you make the most of it because you know you don't own it. You know you don't own it. In every aspect of your life, your marriage, your relationships, your parenting, your work ethic, find their health and their sweet spot because they're motivated by a love for God. That's your why. And without that why, you end up living a life that like this, like, like Warren shares, it's artificial, it's hollow, it's ash. 
And so as we close this morning, we're gonna spend some time in just a few moments singing a chorus. There's gonna be a time of prayer, a benediction. There'll be prayer teams available at the end of our service this morning. But here's what I'm, here's my hope, here's my heart, that the person standing on this stage, that those of you seated in this room, those that are online or listening at this at a later time, we don't leave this moment without a surrendered heart where we say, God, you're God, and I want to love you in the moment. I want to trust you. I want to know you. I want to be one who holds on loosely to everything you give and just lives surrendered before you. A life like this, a life like this, is not how life is meant to be lived. It's artificial and hollow, but a life of surrender. That's where it starts with Jesus. That's how you make that 18-inch distant trek. But also as a Christian, it's how you live life well. It's how you grow as a disciple, by letting the love of God and a love for God be the heartbeat of your life. Don't leave today without surrendering afresh to Jesus. We're going to have a moment where we sing a song. The song's going to talk a little bit about abiding in him. That's what it looks like. God, I'm finding my sustenance, finding my root, finding my wholeness in you.